Should we start? Yeah. Wait a couple more minutes. There's a few still joining, well, quite a few. We got northwest of Ireland, we got Brussels. Uh, that's where I am, by the way, and where Joe is. Um, we've got uh, Cheryl from Singapore, Cass in Belgium, uh, Andrea from Belgium, and someone called Hello from Oxford. No, she's not really called Hello, she's called Sally from Oxford. And hi from hi. Uh, yeah, so still some people joining on. Gigi from Brussels, hello. Joe, are you there? Yeah. All right, okay, I haven't got you anymore. Okay. Should we kick off? I think so, yeah. Yeah, people start to rush after the first, in the first five minutes. So um, welcome yeah. everybody to the first uh, Think Act change workshop. Um, so this is the first in a series bringing sustainability pioneers together to share ideas on how we can all do sustainability better. So thanks for joining us. Hope you're all well. Um, do put your comments and so forth in the chat as we go along. Um, let me introduce myself first. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe Sullivan. So I'm the founder and director of Conscience, which is a boutique consultancy based in Brussels. I help the European Commission, uh, NGOs and uh, companies uh, on sustainability uh, through activist uh, strategic communication. Um, a little bit of background about me. I came to Brussels, uh, at, dare I say it, 30 years ago. Um, I worked across the policy spectrum, so the European Parliament, uh, corporate affairs, association management, uh, and as communication director for two um, quite significant uh, NGOs, BEIC, the European Consumer Organization on Consumer Affairs, and Friends of the Earth Europe on Environment and Social Justice. Um, I design campaigns uh, on chemicals, uh, GMO, uh, climate, uh, agriculture, food. And then 15 years ago, I set up a consultancy uh, to do the work I'm doing now. So um, I love convening people, bringing people together. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Um, let me pass now to David, who's gonna tell you our story about how this came to be. Hi everyone, thank you for uh, coming to this event. Uh, my, my name is David Labby. I have a small um, boutique uh, ethical communications consultancy called Good Point. Um, it's about branding and strategy, brand strategy and creative content for cause-driven organizations from NGOs and uh, social brands to ethical brands, social startups. Um, I came from the world of ma magazine editing, filmmaking, um, marketing for evil global brands before I had a crisis of conscience and I decided to bring my, uh, my skills and experience to this world. Um, so I moved to Brussels recently, but ahead of that, I had been meeting with Joe. Oh, so sorry, good point. We've worked with all kinds of organizations like Greenpeace and Fair, Fair Share, which is uh, Helen's organization that's here. Um, and we do all kinds of things from brand identity to actually producing websites, producing creative content uh, and those kinds of materials, videos. Um, and I was uh, talking a lot with Joe ahead of coming to Brussels because we were work both working in the sort of ethical space, consultancy space. Um, and we are both uh, passionate about convening people um, and creating workshops and experiences that can help people work through different kinds of problems. Um, and we noticed that while Joe comes from the very Brussels y, well, not she doesn't just work in Brussels, but she comes from the strategic uh, advocacy side, and I came from the uh, creative storytelling side, that we made quite a nice uh, synergy there in terms of our different areas. And we've been working with organizations on that basis um, under this uh, banner of Think Like an Activist, Act with Intent 
to help work through different kinds of problems with strategizing and communications and how the worlds of advocacy, policy and communicational storytelling can come together. Because uh, anyone who's here and based in Brussels uh, in that kind of world will have seen uh, quite a difference between the, the, the language and, and that world and the, the rest of it uh, outside the bubble. So we're about kind of bursting those bubbles and bringing different kinds of people together, different kinds of ways of thinking together. And that's the idea behind Think Act Change. So that's why we worked hard to have a panel that represents different kinds of silos of people who are working for sustainability so that people can share ideas between themselves and create uh, more broad coalitions, which is what we're going to need ahead of the, uh, the oncoming uh, economic and social consequences of the pandemic, among everything else that we've been going through. So. Cool. So, um, so our purpose um, of uh, Think Like an Activist, Act with Intent um, is uh, open conversation between sustainability pioneers like uh, our esteemed guest today, um, speeding political change through uh, storytelling and making sure that sustainability in all its forms, and let's get the lexicon right, um, and the scope as well, it includes climate, forest, gender, social impact, we'll hear on all of those aspects today and more, that they stay at the top of the political agenda and indeed at the heart of the economic recovery. Um, so before we start the debate, David is gonna introduce um, in quick storytelling form um, our guest speakers, and then we're gonna get into the debate. So thank you for your patience, David. So uh, please excuse me if I'm massacring your biographies. Um, <laughs> you can correct, correct the record afterwards and you'll presentation, but uh, Monica Morelli Serrano is here from uh, Inca Group, which is part of the um, incredible uh, ecosystem of IKEA, and we're all very familiar with IKEA's homeware, but uh, many of us might also know that IKEA really tries very hard to work to uh, make sustainable living affordable for the many, and they're doing all kinds of work with that, and Monica has been involved in international environments for 14 years. She's been a board member and active leader in purpose-driven organizations. And at Inca Group, IKEA Group, she is responsible for overall stra advocacy strategy in Europe, right where we are near those levers of power, um, some levers of some power. And uh, she's, she's worked on topics like digitalization, sustainability, diversity, and inclusion. So she'll tell us more about that in a minute. Um, we have Joe Blackman, who's head of forest policy. Oh, so Mo Monica is based in Brussels. Joe Blackman is based in London. So Joe is head of forest policy and advocacy at Global Witness. Global Witness is an, an international NGO which exposes corruption, environmental abuse all over the world. From illegal logging of rubber plantations in Papua New Guinea to the dirty hands of big bankers and their support for large scale rainforest destruction. She's also a local go government councillor in Redbridge, London where she was involved in declaring a climate emergency last year. Uh, so a um, little quote from Joe, if you don't mind, uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting you, but it was in the paper. Mandatory due diligence on our financial system is crucial for ensuring that the environment is no longer seen as a way to make a quick buck. Then we have Helena Wolf. Um, Helena is based in Berlin. Um, she spent eight years working very closely with large international civil society organizations and observed as an extreme lack of women at the top tables and the lack of advancement possibilities for someone like herself. Um, so she set up uh, that, among other reasons, prompted her to set up Fair Share, uh, which is a new um, impact NGO that monitors the proportion of women leaders in civil society organizations and puts pressure on those organizations with data to um, advocate that they achieve a fair share of women leaders. And finally, uh, last but not least, Dan, who's in sunny California, Oakland, um, and it's very early for him, so let's go gentle. Um, he's from London, but lives over there. Um, and when he was running an, a nonprofit in his early career, supporting projects in India and Ghana, he realized that because amazing local projects weren't scaled up, a lot of innovation was wasted, a lot of energy and resources were wasted in reinventing the wheel. He eventually set up the nonprofit Spring Impact to help social initiatives successfully scale up their efforts. Uh, he learned tricks of the trade from big beasts like McDonald's Foundation and The Body Shop and has worked extensively with Oxfam and Big Society Capital. He broadened Spring's remit into what's known as social replication, which I'm sure he'll explain uh, shortly. 
um, and they work in extremely in an extremely long list of countries, which are far too many to mention here, all over the world to help social projects make a real and lasting difference. Okay, well, welcome to our speakers. Thank you, David. So. Um, uh, all of our guests are uh, welcome. So do um, uh, put in your insights, your comments in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask a broad question to each speaker now and uh, we're going to hear from them all and then we're going to have a, a dynamic and interactive discussion between us all. So um, do whenever you have an insight or a thought or a question that pops up into your mind during each of the uh, presenters um, interventions at the start. Um, do feel free to pop those into the chat. Um, so the question of the day, um, and I'm going to ask Monica first, um, is uh, would you share your thoughts on the challenges and opportunities you face promoting sustainability in a changing landscape? Over to you, Monica. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me um, to this uh, session. I think uh, I'm very passionate about sustainability. Um, and I have been working in this topic uh, since I arrived in Brussels, uh, which, as you said, it was already getting the mark to half your time, Joe, uh, 15 years now. And um, when I arrived uh, in Brussels, I work uh, for different consultancy for different clients in different sectors. Uh, but my red thread has always been sustainability. And when I um, started in IKEA, um, it was uh, an interesting change because I think from just the way you go there and in the interview, um, people ask you, what's your value? What are your core values? It's a, very, it's a company that it's founded, uh, so rooted with maybe 10, nine values that have evolved, but they are always there and they are always present. And you might not feel it, but sometimes you might challenge them at times, but it is something that is very rooted within the IKEA culture. Um, so for me, when it, I was a bit shocked, I said like, what do you, Think about values and sustainability is actually one of them and it kind of made me reflect a lot on how the company is structured and how they do advocacy especially because you know when we deal with uh, policy makers and when we see legislation when you are in a consultancy there are the usual suspects that say oh we don't like this legislation to just you know get rid of it as soon as possible whereas in IKEA the approach is we might not like it, we might disagree with some of the objectives, but let's look at what we can actually achieve or let's actually try to propose something positive. So the tone is already very different from what I was used to. So the simple vision of IKEA is actually the purpose of IKEA is our vision. And that vision is to create a better everyday, everyday life for the many people. And prior to COVID, it actually was a bit complicated to explain what this means because we think that life at home uh, is the most important. Your home is where you feel safe, is when you wake up. But it was very complicated for people's minds as a fair reflection. But now I think the whole COVID crisis has changed completely the meaning of home because most of us have spent, I think, the longest amount of time in our home. We start realizing that Maybe the wall needs to be changed. Maybe there's too much noise. Maybe there is, it's cold, it's warm. Maybe you needed a chair. Maybe you needed some different cooking utensils because you are preparing three meals a day. So I think the whole concept of home is changing. Um, and of course, that is actually an opportunity for us uh, because we can bring solutions to some of the very everyday life problems uh, that you may face. And we want to do this, we wanted to do it even prior to COVID, but I think this just kind of reaffirmed the need um, from a company that is home furnishing businesses. And for me, it's just if we can fulfill this idea, because the home has never been more important, but also I think the crisis will teach us along the way that uh, there will be people with thinner wallets. So affordability will become a key element of our of the economy and it's a key element for us and our business model. So I think, yes, the crisis is there. Uh, we actually suffer it um, more, well, not more than anybody else, but uh, like many of the retailers, we had to close 80% of our stores. So we made like huge losses during six weeks. Um, but this is not stopping us for doing what we think is right on sustainable. And I will get there in a, in a moment. 
But before that, I wanted just to tell you the reason why we think this is the moment for uh, businesses to take leadership. And this is some of the facts that we found during COVID. Actually, Edelman Trust found this. Um, so 71% of people are agreed that brands and companies that place their profits before people during the crisis will lose their trust forever. I think this is kind of the realization if, I mean, for us, it was already there but for many other brands that actually they need to start looking at something else that's the bottom line. You will see that, you know, companies expect to protect jobs. Uh, people want to talk about products that acknowledge the impacts in life. So a lot of the things that we have in our heads from long time ago, they are just becoming more visible. We also see that you know, the trust in governments is increasing because of course we are kind of more bound to the rules. So I think there is an opportunity to reshape um, the role that brands uh, have in society as a whole. So taking this into consideration, we went down and said, okay, definitely there will be things that we will need to change in IKEA going forward. Some of our objectives uh, for growth, we might not achieve it, we might achieve it different, but what does it mean for sustainability? And after looking at everything that happens, we have now reconfirmed all our pre-corona investments and thereby also our goal to be climate positive by 2030. This means that all our uh, investments on renewables and on recycling uh, will continue uh, speeding up technologies that uh, help us um, improve our operations will stay. And the main reason is because we believe that the climate crisis is not something that disappeared just because we have a health crisis. On the contrary, I think many of the now data are also saying that in the regions where um, the climate is worse or pollution actually associated uh, with uh, some of the climate change is worst, um, is, is actually the ones that have suffered more corona deaths. So there is a real need for us to address the health crisis, the economic crisis, but without overlooking what we, where we are all here, that is sustainability and the sustainable change. Uh, we have a very strong uh, leadership and commitment from our CEO, who is very active in the different forums on sustainability. Um, and he said, okay, we, we have a choice between rebuilding the economy as it was, or rebuilding the economy in a sustainable way. And if we get the money right in the right places, then actually that will help us to change the way we look at the economy as a whole. So for example, when you have like now a need for affordable products, maybe the circular economy will actually boom. The reparability will increase. The need for people to protect more and take care of their for us over furniture or their, their, um, their items at home will increase. So this is actually an opportunity for us um, to change some of the services, but to remain valid and, and trust what we actually have agreed prior to Corona. So we are a bit of uh, optimistic uh, and we see that there are opportunities in what we call the, the new normal. So there is a chance to reboot the economy in a sustainable way. There is an opportunity to build more, a, a more resilient society, business and jobs. And we do think that um, advocacy escalates and will just change shape, but the need for leadership will continue. And I think this is the moment where companies like ours, um, and I hope many others can join us to change the way the economy functions into a more sustainable way. I leave it there. Excellent, thank you, Monica, that's really, um... Uh, interesting to hear um, that the company remains committed and if not even more committed and I know that IKEA is one of the companies that's quite actively uh, on pursuing and promoting the Green Deal which is the European uh, policy framework to make sure that there is a, a greener economy and the kind of building back um, the economy better that that is not lost. Um, so it's good to see that uh, corporate uh, activism, actually. I'm gonna pass the floor directly to Joe Blackman, now Global Witness, over to you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, assuming you can hear me okay, yeah? Um, great, thanks for <clears throat> the opportunity to come and speak today. I was actually a rather last minute addition as my colleague, Rachel, 
um, was unable to participate, but I'm really pleased to be able to be here in her place. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about Global Witness and our particular approach and methodology and the, the sort of things we do. I'm going to talk a bit then about the challenge of global deforestation, which is my specific focus, um, and some of the specific policy solutions that we're advocating um, in that sphere. So uh, very briefly, I, um, as was said in the introduction, Global Witness is a global anti-corruption and human rights NGO. We work to expose corruption human rights abuses and environmental destruction, and we campaign to change the systems that enable them to happen. So our, our specific model is that we undertake very detailed investigations. We have a team of um, investigators who many of them have backgrounds in investigative journalism, also some in the military as well. Um, we, they, we spend a lot of time documenting wrongdoing on the ground, both the environmental impacts and the human impacts. Um, where natural resources are being exploited. And we look at then the whole ecosystem around that destruction. So we look at the key players, the key companies, the individuals, the global supply chains and the financing. And we use this information to then advocate for policy and, and legislative change to stop the destruction and also to, to hold the companies to account. So in that way, we're, I guess, contributing to corporate accountability. Um, but at the same time, we're also building a picture of the systemic nature of the challenge. And we understand fully that that also requires regu regulatory solutions at scale and a sort of systemic approach as well beyond these specific investigations. Um, some of our historic campaigns that you might have heard of include some of our work around conflict minerals, also blood diamonds and, and the timber trade, specifically where we've looked at how the global trade has fueled conflict in places like Colombia, Cambodia, Liberia, um, and Zimbabwe and others. We've also, um, in line with our um, attempts to seek systemic change, we've been influential in the establishment of some global processes, such as the Kimberley process for diamonds, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, um, the EU timber regulation, and more recently, the EU's um, uh, responsible sourcing regulation for minerals. So more specifically on, on deforestation, which is what I spend a lot of my time working on at the moment. Um, as you're no doubt aware, forests are really crucial in, in tackling global climate change. They both store and absorb significant um, amounts of carbon emissions and also play a global role in the regulation of the climate. They're also crucial for biodiversity as well, particularly tropical forests, which are home to over 80% of the, the world's species. Um, the key drivers of deforestation are generally the expansion of the agri-industry um, to feed the global market. So this includes uh, products like soy, palm oil, beef, timber products and, and cocoa. Um, and some of our research last year, we published a report called Money to Burn, which traced the financing of six of the most harmful agribusiness companies involved in deforestation. And we found a staggering six billion of euros over six, six years from EU-based financial institutions into those companies, making the EU the biggest source of global finance for these companies. So we hear a lot of good rhetoric from businesses on climate and deforestation, but sadly, when we look at concrete action, there's still a significant gap. Um, many global brands have committed to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains by 2020. So that's this year. And you'd think that was given added impetus by the global outrage at the devastating fires we saw in the Amazon last year. But sadly not, many of those brands, including Cargill and Nestle, are now admitting they, they won't meet those targets um, and have actually taken the, that target of a year away from off of their policies. Um, and there's a group called Global Canopy that's assess, assessed the policies of 500 of most influential companies and uh, in forest risk supply chains. And again, what they found was, was pretty dire, really. There was a lack of action, any action, by almost half of the companies that they assessed. And 68% of financial institutions they assessed had no policies at all on deforestation. So faced with this corporate failure, frankly, to tackle deforestation, um, what's the answer? Well, we're seeing increasing calls um, for action and kind of specifically also around due diligence as a tool. Um, and it really feels like momentum's building on this um, at EU level, but in other jurisdictions as well, actually. Um, I think it helps that businesses are familiar with due diligence 
as they practice their dues for identifying commercial risks associated with um, investment decisions, for example. So what we're calling for is mandatory due diligence. So um, to be extended on to environmental harm and human rights abuses. So what do we mean by that? We mean um, that's the process whereby you identify, mitigate, prevent and report on, on those risks. Um, and as I say, we're seeing quite significant momentum, particularly at EU level. Um, there was quite an exciting announcement just a couple of weeks ago by the Justice Commissioner Reinders, who announced intentions to bring forward legislation on due diligence in 2021. Um, and that's a broader due diligence. And at the same time on deforestation, um, we're also anticipating legislation next year. And we understand due diligence is one of the tools under consideration there. So big challenges, feeling often kind of quite helpless and overwhelming but at the same time i think we're seeing a real sense that this of recognition of the systemic challenge and the, and the need for answers at that scale um and that's yeah that's what we spend our time working at on and i'm really interested to have any kind of further discussions with with the panel and others that are joining on on, on what that means and, and what current challenges we're facing as well Thank you so much, Joe. That was um, fascinating, and I'm sure your work is never ending, in fact, um, especially with the globe and deforestation, especially some of the political um, uh, systems um, that are in place right now, which have kind of made a lot of it progressive or normalized um, mass destruction. Um, we're going to come later to, um, I know you've done work with um, indigenous peoples and environmental defenders and bringing them to kind of the, the um, policy makers face to face, but we'll come back to that later. I'll now pass the floor to Helena from Fair Share. Uh, Helena, over to you. You're muted, Helena. You need to unmute. Joe, I think that you can unmute Helena. Can I? Yeah, if you click on her little, because you're the meeting host, you can unmute her. I think. Let me try. Okay, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we need to start again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope you can at least see uh, my screen. Yeah, put it maybe on side share views. Yeah, exactly. I will. All right. So, um, just a very brief introduction. I'm Helene. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Fair Share of Women Leaders, which is a fairly new initiative, just over a year old formally, that um, tries to look at a credibility gap in the social impact sector and with a focus on NGOs at the moment between um, their commitment and purpose around gender equality, the sustainable development goals, uh, human rights and social justice, and how they reflect those values within their own organizations with a very strong focus on gender equality. Because many uh, organizations very specifically focus on gender equality in their programming and advocacy, um, or it is at least part of the SDG framework under which they operate, but they don't reflect this within their own structures, especially not in leadership positions. So um, the sector is largely um, women who, who deliver the work, but uh, they don't make it to the top. And so based on my own experience and many others who have worked in the sector for many years, um, we uh, decided to tackle this and our key tool that we developed so far is our fair share monitor where we measure um, the number of women and staff and um, compare to the number of women in senior management including the ceo and the number of women on boards to see um, how big the gap is between the workforce and 
the women in leadership positions. And so far, we've done this with uh, 31 big international civil society organizations um, in the international sphere. And we also have a first kind of national initiative in Germany where we look at uh, more than 80 organizations. They are NGOs and large foundations. And the key goal is to create transparency and accountability about uh, how organizations walk the talk on gender equality in their own organizations because um, if they can't implement gender equality within their own structures that undermines their legitimacy and credibility to call for that in their own programming and external advocacy and so for two years in a row we have now um, looked at this data and um, we see that there has been progress at least that awareness is raising around the issue. And so um, there's a growing number of women in leadership positions and there's also a growing number of organizations who share their data and uh, think it is relevant enough for them to look at this issue and topic and 18 have even committed to achieve real change by 2030. And so we connect our data collection with a call for commitment from those organizations that we look at to achieve gender equality and a fair share by 2030. So together with the um, sustainable development goals. But we're definitely not, the work is definitely not done. And I think um, this will be even more difficult now looking at what's happening around the corona crisis as um, I do see a risk that issues like gender equality, diversity and inclusion will be considered luxury problems again um, and I think it will be quite interesting and maybe also frustrating to see how the next years will look like because what we have already seen is that um, boards are definitely not gender uh, equal or have gender parity and so even though CEOs are increasingly women they are increasingly governed and controlled by men and uh, currently a man is almost three times more likely to get into a leadership position meaning in senior management or boards than a woman and so we are committed to continue to watch this and to um, scale up our data collection um, and I think talking about challenges raised by the COVID-19 crisis is that it will be very tough to now scale this up as uh, organizations now have sort of a great excuse to uh, look at other topics that feel more important than gender equality. But at the same time, we have seen that women leaders and leaders who apply different leadership um, qualities than the typical one that we kind of um, account to uh, hierarchical male leadership styles uh, tend to deal with the crisis in a much more transparent and accountable way. So I do see risks and opportunities at the same time, but of course the numbers are a very superficial level to look at um, because this uh, it's it's a numbers game and we're trying to also look behind the numbers and see how do organizations in the social impact sector have to redefine what they consider good leadership. And that's where we do our work around new leadership styles based on feminist values and feminist leadership approaches to also um, achieve change not only on the data side and the number side but also in how those organizations are led so that their impact can be as large as possible for women and girls but also for their uh, staff and any other projects that they are um, that they are leading and so uh, next to the kind of tough data and commitment that we call for to have more women in formal leadership positions we also call on different, for different leadership styles that are much more participatory, inclusive, diverse, and collective than what is uh, currently still the 
overarching leadership approach in many of those organizations. And obviously, over the next couple of months, we will work hard to kind of avoid the risks around gender equality becoming a less big of a topic for some of those organizations. And we do see some of those signs, but um, focus on the opportunities that um, there's a growing awareness now that women deliver some of the most relevant jobs and work. Uh, for example, in paid and uncare, unpaid care work around the world that they face much higher risks of domestic violence and abuse while families are locked in around the globe. And um, uh, kind of a fun fact is that uh, there are some studies that show that women come into leadership positions, especially in times of crisis. So we might even see an increase in numbers and then we have to make sure that it also um, achieves real change and impact in how organizations are dealing with uh, a crisis like this, but also within their other programming in a much more impactful way than they currently do. And I'm looking forward to hear your questions and thoughts. So now you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I just was saying that, um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. That was really uh, fascinating. And we've all seen um, on a global level, Yacinda Arendt in New Zealand, a fantastic leadership uh, model, very structured, very clear, very calm, and very um, compassionate. I'll thank you, Elena. I'm going to pass the floor now to Dan. So Dan, could you share us, uh, with us your insights, um, how you see sustainability going forward? What does it mean to you? And what are the challenges and opportunities that we all face? Sure. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, David. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, so 15 years ago, I founded my first nonprofit and it raises money to rate to provide education and foster small business in Ghana and India. And it's actually still going strong today. And we supported some wonderful social entrepreneurs, but I got frustrated and I got frustrated that they frequently tended to repeat mistakes others had made rather than really building upon what actually works. And I found that we didn't lack for committed people. The problem was they kept reinventing the wheel. And so I thought that if we could only get really the best proven ideas to scale up and to increase their reach, and in the process, draw in, coach great people to run their operations, these organizations could be much more effective. So running a not-for-profit, uh, as many of you know, uh, is a more than a full-time job, and I really need time to think. So I got on a fellowship, and had 18 months for self-directed research. And I really wanted to get under the skin of organizations that had achieved scale and managed to achieve, um, in particular, a consistent level of quality when doing so. So I went to McDonald's, the restaurant, so I went to their headquarters and spent six months there learning about how to achieve consistent quality at huge scale. And uh, McDonald's really was an eye-opening experience. I saw what having passionate and highly trained people and perfect processes can do for scale. Um, and really, you know, left feeling that if we could do the same uh, in the social sector as they do when they're selling burgers and fries, the possibilities in our work seem pretty endless. So for the second half of the fellowship, I took those lessons to Oxfam uh, and I began to apply principles of replication, franchising and scale to the social sector. And we had a number of organizations scaling in ways that they previously, previously hadn't thought possible. And I started getting asked to bring these ideas to organizations to develop scale strategy and implementation plans. And that was really why I founded Spring Impact um, as a not-for-profit to help proven social innovation scale up. So at Spring ourselves, we've worked with almost 250 organizations now across the develop and developing world. Uh, includes a number of foundations who we help with strategic plans uh, to maximize and scale up their impact. There's 20 of us uh, across uh, offices in London and San Francisco and, and a couple of years ago I relocated to San Francisco to continue to build the organization here. So I just wanted to talk through a couple of um, projects which I think will begin to answer some of your questions about sustainability, Joe. Um, let me just share my screen while I do that.
So um, that's our spring. So the first project which I want to mention is uh, Cultivare, who are based in Senegal. So in uh, Cultivare really works with smallholder farmers uh, who have an incredibly tough time in, in rural Senegal to you know, plant the right seeds, understand um, how they can grow a crop and support their families. And um, we uh, identified pretty early on a, a program which was actually a project of the USAID, the American um, Development Agency, that was doing some really interesting things by creating what they call social franchises locally in small villages to link smallholder farmers to um, uh, the big agricultural suppliers to give them really good grain seeds so they could grow a better crop. And um, what they were doing is creating these uh, local entrepreneurs who were able not only to sell seeds, but also to teach local farmers how to farm more effectively and increase their crop yields. And um, we took this idea that was working in a couple of small villages. Uh, you can see one of the villages here in the, in the photos and uh, developed a, a system inspired by, uh, by what McDonald's has done actually, by um, creating strong systems and processes so that other entrepreneurs in farming communities across Senegal could copy these ideas and become the hub uh, and, uh, of sort of local businesses and training farmers across Senegal. We spun it out of USAID and turned it into a social enterprise, um, a, a business. And so there are now uh, over 80 entrepreneurs um, providing seeds uh, and enhanced uh, agricultural supplies across Senegal. So not only is the sustainability baked into the model because it's businesses, but also they're providing the livelihoods for many others as well. So that's, that's one way um, we look at sustainability through using the power of social enterprise, the power of business to be able to scale up something that works. The second example I thought that would be um, interesting is Lava May, which is very close to my heart. Uh, for any of you who've been to San Francisco recently, uh, or the Bay Area more generally, there is a serious homeless uh, issue here, and, and it's really kind of in your face. And um, when I arrived, one of my first priorities was to see if we could get involved with some local homelessness nonprofits. And Lava May was one that I just found <clears throat> incredibly inspiring. Um, I know that you know obviously you want to deal with root cause but actually the symptoms are pretty serious uh, here and there weren't there weren't really non-profits that were just directly targeting the the symptoms and so you can see here a before and an after photo they retrofit buses with showers give meals and which is the first step to getting uh, homeless people cleaned up so they can do things like interview and move on to other services and so when we first started working with Lava May, um, they were just based in San Francisco doing incredible work and they wanted to open up their first office and eventually scale across the world. And so the first thing we did was, was help them open in Los Angeles, which they're now doing successfully. It was what we call a, a wholly owned operation. They just literally set up a new nonprofit in, in LA. Um, and um, sorry, I might have children running behind me, but I guess most people are used to that now. Um, <laughs> um, we, uh, they set up a, a, a not-for-profit in LA and what they found is that while it was successful it was really hard work to replicate lock, stock and barrel the whole thing and so we went back to the strategy and thought through what else could we do how else could we scale the impact and really just strive towards sustainability what we did is we created a toolkit um, just simply wrote down if you want to set up a lava main in your city or a Lava May inspired program, you can go through this toolkit, follow the 10 steps of how to set up um, a, a similar program and do it yourself. And in the last two years, we've had about 170 copycat solutions being set up around the world um, and just hundreds of thousands of people being met um, through taking a different approach to sustainability and scale rather than, um, you know, that quite arduous program of uh, idea of setting up new offices. So there's two different ideas there uh, as, as to how you can get sustainability at a program level, Lava May and Cultivare, uh, and much more to say, but I'll hand it back. And um, I think we've got an interesting mix of speakers, so keen to, keen to uh, talk further. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that was really, really fantastic to hear about what you've been doing. Um, and I just want to come straight in with a question because um, we 
still are working out the timings of uh, these kinds of online events. And uh, uh, we, we were imagining half an hour of debate, but the, the speeches were extremely interesting. Um, so I'm gonna go straight in with a question that kind of um, embraces some of the questions that have come up in the chat. So excuse me that it's not one of the chat questions verbatim, but I, I think that it's in the spirit of a couple of the questions that I saw there. Um, and so we're all thinking about COVID, 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 COVID. Uh, we're all sick of the word, sick of the, the, the sight of it. Um, and I hope everyone's staying, staying safe uh, with all of these changes that are happening and able to work. Um, of course, it's impacting a lot on disadvantaged communities around the world who are really vulnerable anyway. Um, so in the world of sustainability, we're all looking anxiously, and some of you touched upon it in your speaker, in your speeches, we're all looking anxiously at how we can somehow operationalize uh, what's going on to, to try and create new paradigm, a post-pandemic paradigm um, that can in some way address these things, to, to be on the front foot and proactive about what's happening rather than just reactive. Um, certainly a lot of companies and governments are also using it for their own gains and so we have to be vigilant and have to be strategic um, that's part of why we wanted to talk about coalitions building coalitions that that um, that we can all learn from each other and go beyond the um the silos that we usually work in so i wanted to ask more specifically i'm going to actually ask to all four of you um that uh, Helena, perhaps it's something that there was in the chat about how you've built coalitions with other feminist leaders around the world to go outside of the, the bubble. Um, that uh, Monica, I thought it might be interesting to know about IKEA, of course, the, the, the very lofty goals of sustainability are, are very uh, much to be praised. Um, how does that come when it comes to competition between other companies? How is there, is there possibilities of any collaborations with other providers or companies, or is it strictly uh, collaborations with NGOs and civil society? Is it possible to have collaboration within business uh, with, the, with the drive of competition? Um, Global Witness, uh, sorry, Joe from Global Witness, I wanted to ask with the companies who are using perhaps COVID as well as an opportunity to shred their obligations or the things that they promised they would do. Uh, what are there uh, other kinds of coalitions that you can build in order to put uh, pressure on those companies to stand up to, you know, to align their practice with their purpose, as, as we said. And uh, finally, Dan, uh, I know that you work brilliantly on helping NGOs and social initiatives scale up. I know in the past you have worked with um, companies as well, but is it, is it important for you to strictly stick within that uh, realm where you can have the most impact with your expertise? Or is there possibilities for um, using the same techniques to try and push companies to, to act uh, in more sustainable ways? So that was a kind of general question and a specific perhaps um, uh, development for each one of you. So I don't know whoever wants to go. Uh. <laughs> I'm happy to go first also because there was a question around that in the chat specifically to me. And I do think one of the key success factors for, for our little new initiative was that we did it as a collective of many people who cared very deeply about our issue and who are willing to chip in their knowledge, their expertise, their network, um, and also their free time basically, or their spare time, even though many of them don't really have that. So um, it's something I'm incredibly proud of because I think it's part of walking the talk ourselves because um, acting collectively and participatory uh, um, and with within a diversity of actors is a key part of of the new kind of feminist leadership that we hope to bring to the sector and so we very consciously um, did that ourselves and um, even though you would think it takes longer because you have so many people chipping in we actually found that it's uh, scaled us up super quickly because people kind of could um, bring in their uh, their backgrounds and it made us faster and it made us more um, uh, I think content wise it made us much more focused on what we want to do but at the same time based on a very diverse set of perspectives and so um, it's something that, um, that didn't hinder us, but rather moved us forward. 
and I think it's something that that I would hope to to see much more in a post COVID world because I think that's that's what will be desperately needed across sectors but also within sectors because those are such huge challenges that cannot be solved by one company or one sector alone. Uh, that's great. Does uh, someone else, uh, maybe uh, so someone else can jump in, Dan? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. I think that was really helpful. And we, uh, David, as you said, we have worked with companies before, but we very much do so um, starting looking at the system, focusing on social, the social impact or the problem we're seeking to address, and then looking at what role companies can play. Um, I think this has been alluded to a little bit here, but um, with companies, you can have very strong leadership. They can be impact focused and then, you know, stock prices uh, wobble and suddenly leadership changes and, and focus is completely different. And so I think uh, obviously companies play a, a critical part of many ecosystems, but for a social organization focused on sustainability, it's important to look at the ecosystem that you're operating in as a whole, the problem you're trying to solve, and then companies is just one lever as a way to solve that problem rather than the, uh, than the, the, than the solution. I can go next. Um, mm -hmm. I think for us, uh, you know, we, we are a very collaborative uh, company. We think that not everybody can do everything, but everyone can do something. Um, and I think uh, we have a very strong um, community of friends in the in the business sector uh, for some topics and I think what Dan mentioned is important you need to see what type of problem uh, you want to address um, for example now in the sustainability and financing it is important that we talk to the businesses uh, and business community and finance institutions because those are the ones that hold the, the money and the financing so we work quite a lot on that with them um, however, we also have like social entrepreneurs program uh, where we are looking at problems that we face in the community. Uh, so, for example, we are expanding a lot into city centers. And in Paris, there was also a similar problem with homeless. And we tried to figure out what will be the, the solution for us to be in the city center and fill some of the gaps that we have uh, when it comes to delivery and taking recycling over packages, etc. So we had to find some of the social entrepreneurs and build uh, some links with the community that they um, where they were the majors, uh, some of the uh, city councils plus the NGOs. So I think it was a very collaborative approach. And now what we have is a is a solution in which uh, some of the homeless people start just by threading cardboard and then you know they build up their skills they then they can pick up the cardboard from a bike from the people's homes and then they can even drive a van so we actually address some societal problem that actually help us in, to do our business so i think we are open always to discuss with different actors in society but we need to be clear about what the problem is that we want to address and what the goal is because I think everybody needs to agree on the goals, otherwise we could not move um, together. Hi, shall I chip in on the, the point? Uh, yeah, the specific question for me was, I guess, around collaboration um, and, and impacts on the ground, I think. So um, I agree that, as, as Monica and Dan both said, companies are just one lever and it's a more complex kind of ecosystem, including finance and governments as well. And, and it's important to have a strategy that approaches all of those. In terms of collaboration as well and COVID-19, I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of land and environmental defenders. So these are individuals um, that are really at the front line of what is often a kind of violent expansion of industrial agriculture into areas that frankly shouldn't be exploited in the way that they're being exploited. And I think, um, you know, when thinking about collaboration, collaboration with those at the moment, it's a really challenging time. I mean, these are often people who are having, facing severe impacts on their livelihoods from COVID-19. We're not just talking about lockdown in a nice, uh, nice middle class home. I mean, this is really, you know, this is really hard. It's a matter of survival for a lot of these people. Combined with that, they're facing increasingly draconian measures. Um, limits on their freedoms um, and you know some of the key elements of justice are falling away and the governments are using the excuse of this current crisis moment to really leave them very vulnerable actually and, and we've seen um, cases already of, of them being murdered as well and I think there's 
what's really important for us when we're collaborating there is that we don't as as you know a sort of northern ngo we don't necessarily we don't have the legitimacy to speak on their behalf so it's really about giving them the space and a platform to amplify those voices and now with the lockdown thinking about ways to do that really creatively so using podcasts is an example of one thing we've just done um, and using digital to try and get their, their voices over. And if we, we've also, I think from this question about telling stories as well, it's really interesting because our work on Defenders has had the biggest kind of communications impact and engagement across all of our work. And I really think that's because you're telling stories about how individuals are affected. And that's what's so powerful. And the best people to tell those stories uh, are really the people themselves. And then it, it's you know we've got to help them work out how you link that up to policymakers and companies and financiers to get the change but i think as well thinking about covid19 we're very much how are, how are our communities affected um and we've seen some great community initiatives it's kind of making sure we don't retreat into a kind of nationalist narrower um realm of of what's the solution and we kind of we keep it global and i do think part of that is having the people that are on the front line Kind of telling those stories and having them at the, the, the front of our minds so that that really through that storytelling and that first-hand testimony we're really holding companies to account and we're reminding you know policymakers and companies and financiers of this global chain and that the responsibility should be all the way up you know um and i think that's that's going to also be a challenge to kind of keep that mindset you know through through the covid19 recovery phase recovery and rebuilding phase Thanks so much. Uh, we're very, very close to the end. So just we wanted to kind of uh, wrap up. Um, we would have liked to have had much more debate. There was even some debate going on in the chat between uh, Helen and Dan. So I hope you all read that as well. Um, so we're working on multiple media here. But I think that it was really interesting, the last point about storytelling and about how you're connecting with the people on the ground connecting them with policymakers. I think a lot of what people have been talking about is how we can connect uh, different people in order to push for the sustainability agenda and connect in different ways. And COVID in some way has enabled us to shrink the distances between us as well as it's made it, the distances much bigger between me and someone on the streets and me and all of you, that is the same. We both have to see each other through this medium somehow. So in some ways it's squashed the distances between so many different actors worldwide. And that's uh, hopefully something that this kind of event and many 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 other sorts of initiatives can can do to bring different people together in different ways to create new kinds of coalitions cool um i'm so sorry we don't have more time to for the questions in the chat and also um, i feel like we're just getting started um uh, in a way uh, we could like chat here all afternoon um but we have an hour slot uh, i'm afraid um i just want to say um what i've really noticed in this covid19 and the green deal recovery in this conversation it's still still quite focused pressure and reality on the eu that there's going to be a green deal i mean it's obviously the devil is always in the detail what are the policies going to look like really but that what i've really noticed and i hope this is true going forward and it, it really um from Joe, you and from Helen, and also from Monica and Dan, all of you, in fact, you know this angle of social justice and the just transition. Um, I mean, I, I always wonder about the word, the lexicon, the words we use, if there's enough meaning behind them. So does sustainability now include social justice and the just transition? Um, I hope it does. And I think on that note, um, I'll just like to say thank you to all of you for coming on. Thank you for listening. And um, if you want to get in touch for our next events, we've got two more coming up in May. There's one next Tuesday and there's one um, the following week on the Thursday. Uh, so I think the 19th and also the 28th of May, um, all around the topic of sustainability, building collaboration, um, aligning purpose with practice, and also activating in a creative uh, storytelling way to really speed up advocacy, to make sure we get the regulatory framework that we all need to kind of push some of these issues forward. So I'd just like to say thank you to you all. Um, sorry to have to cut short the debate and um, do link in to David and I also if you want to send us an email. We kind of promote through LinkedIn rather than having email lists. So uh, do connect with us and that way you'll stay in touch with what we're doing. So thank you all for joining and I'll just say bye bye for now. Thank you. Thank you all. to all the speakers and thanks for everyone for coming.